Shabbat Shalom, everybody. It's so great to have all of you here with us this morning. And as I like to always begin with is the fact that the Torah is the light of the world. And these flashing lights are like the people all over the world that are tuning in right now. We're so grateful for all of those that are here locally, all those around the United States, around the world, who want to magnify the Torah and make it honorable once again, which is why here our motto has been from the very beginning, taking Torah to the nations. And I'd like to also remind everybody, this coming Rosh Hashanah will be our 25th anniversary. Woo! Our very first service was literally on Rosh Hashanah. That was our very first service. Uh, but let's stand and let's pray as we open this service together. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevo Machuto Le'olam Ba'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be the name of his glorious sovereignty forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart, and you shall teach them thoroughly to your children. And you shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and upon your gates. When the word entered the world, freedom entered it. Its highest teaching is love and kindness. That is the whole Torah. Go and learn it, honoring one another, doing acts of kindness and making peace. These are our highest duties. Let us learn in order to teach. It's a tree of life to those who hold fast. All who cling to it find happiness. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Amen. Together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let us not enter into testing, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Mode ani lefaneka, melekai vikiyam, shaheka zarta bi, nishmati bakemla. Rabah and Munateka. Thankful is what I am before your face, O King, living and eternal, for restoring my soul within me with compassion. Great is your faithfulness. Turn to someone and say Shabbat Shalom. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Just a reminder to the ladies next Sunday, we have in the presentation from Sylvia Calderon and her daughters. They're coming to do a dance presentation, and, uh, and eventually they will, uh, our group from this congregation will meet with them here, and they will do the, another two presentations. So next Saturday, next Sunday, excuse me, from 12 to 3, if anybody wants to bring a side dish, that's wonderful, but El Shaddai is going um, to provide the food, okay? So remember, next Sunday, I want to see everybody here. Okay, thanks. Just want to say that even if you're not especially interested in dance, this is our chance, ladies, just to get together and fellowship. And I hope that you will enjoy seeing a presentation on dance and maybe come and dance with me or Becky in the back where we are every Shabbat dancing in worship. So come take this opportunity to find out more about that and enjoy fellowshipping together. Thank you. Yay.
All right. As you all know, every uh, Shabbat, uh, we have Torah Club right after uh, the service. And on Tuesdays, <coughs> we have prayer time. And then on Thursdays, we have manna time. And I'm excited today, the second half is going to be David Rubin. He's here, got picked up at the airport yesterday, and uh, he will be here in time to speak. I'm not sure exactly how soon he'll get here, but he'll be here really soon. And then as Rocio just announced, uh, next Sunday from uh, noon to 3, we'll have that dance team here. We want to remind everybody, we've got our calendar that goes all the way to 2026, and it ties in together our regular calendar as well as the, the biblical calendar. Then we also have uh, the Mark Biltz Phonetic New Testament, uh, which I believe is literally the number one most scholarly, literally translated online Bible for the 21st century. One of the things that we're doing, many people have been getting this as a download, but what you may not know, Danny and I are continually updating it. Okay, because there's going to be no end to the things that we find. Uh, so many of you, as you go back through it again and you look, you're going to see more green, more changes. And so we're really excited that we're keeping this updated. Now, for all of those that live in uh, Alabama area, next weekend, Danny Bengiki is going to speak. Okay, because he'll be our guest speaker. I'm going to be in Alabama uh, and I'm going to be spending the whole day there on Shabbat. I'll be teaching um, next Saturday morning from 9 to 11.30, then 1.30 to 4, then 6 to 8. And so for anyone around that area, Mississippi, Tennessee, Georgia, I'd love to see you there. Now, many of you know about the America at War hardback. Well, guess what Danny figured out? Danny is so smart. Right now, you, can, you saw how cool it was when you could turn the pages how this is such a beautiful book. We now have it available on phones, iPads, whatever you want, and it formatted it perfectly. So if you get the digital edition, no matter what, you can use it on any uh, type of computer that you have. With that said, let's stand. And let's pray. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much for everything that you're doing in all of our lives. And I just pray as uh, we sing before you and give you all the honor that you so deserve. I want us to really realize we're singing this not because it's just a song. We're not singing it into the thin air. We are singing it in relationship with you and to you. And give us all eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to understand. Your love for us, in Yeshua's name, amen. Of the Lord of hosts. How 
Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord an applause. You may be seated. Okay, last week, if you remember, the Torah portion was what? Noach. Yeah, yeah, Bereshit, Noach. And then today is Lech Lecha, which means what? Go forth. But what's interesting, it's twice Lech Lecha. Uh, and what he's saying is, Abraham, you go, but don't do it necessarily because I'm commanding you to go. Go do it for yourself. Okay, you're going to find, you're going to be very happy if you go. Now, oftentimes, sometimes we don't want to, like, jump off the cliff when God says jump off the cliff, you know, but he says, you'll be glad you do it. Uh, okay. Uh, last week, if you remember, we have Genesis 11.4. And listen to, I want you to get the heartbeat of man versus the heartbeat of Abraham. Here they said, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top reaches to the sky. And then again, let's make ourselves a name. Let's we're scattered abroad on the surface of the whole earth. How many of you know there are people have buildings built with their name on it? Or they have bridges with their name on it. Or they have streets with their name on it. It happens everywhere because people want to have some kind of a legacy. They want to be remembered beyond their lifespan. So here at the Tower of Babel, all the nations are those people that were together left after the flood. They wanted to build a name for themselves. And if you remember, they built it over the dead bodies that they had buried in the plain. That's where the Tower of Babel is built because all of the people that drowned ended up going right down into this area. And our next story is about Abraham. And when we look at this story, his whole concern is building a name for his lost brother. This is why he marries his dead brother's wife. He wants to carry on her name. And then what does he do? He builds an altar to the name of the Lord. So here you have everyone wanting to build a name for themselves, but Abraham is more concerned about carrying on other people's names, carrying on God's name. So let's look at Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Uh, well, let me just say this too. Because of Abraham's attitude toward preserving another's name and God's name, what does God tell Abraham? I will make your name great. That's what he says. So the question right now, Will we side with Abraham to make God's name great, or are we going to be like those of the Tower of Babel who only wanted to make a name for themselves? Which reminds me of a whole uh, another thing that I think I'll be speaking in a couple of weeks, but I may just bring it up right now just for fun. Go over it again in a couple of weeks. Why do you eat? For nourishment. And why do you want nourishment? To live? And why do you want to live? Well, you know, I got to go to work. I got to make money. I got to do this. I got to do that. Wrong. I'm going to talk about this in a couple weeks, but I'll just remind you. What do angels eat? <laughs> Angel food cake? No. No. That's a good one. But it says they ate manna, which was angels' food. Why do angels need to eat? Uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I'm going to develop this a little bit more in a couple of weeks. But here's the thing that we want to think about. The New Testament also says to do everything is under the Lord. When I get up, do I just think, okay, I got to go to work? Or do I think, wow, what do I got to do for God today? Uh, our whole focus has always been, I get up, I go to work, I eat to do this or do that. But oh my goodness, people would have such a higher self-esteem if they realize everything they do, if they do it under the Lord, I'm doing it because I'm here to build the kingdom of God. So what, whatever my job is, if it's sweeping floors, if it's driving a truck, it doesn't matter. You want to be doing it as unto the Lord. Does that make sense? 
wow, our whole life becomes completely different when we ultimately realize and we see I'm not going to work just to feed myself. I'm going to work because I'm building the kingdom of God right here on earth right now. You know what that did to me? That means I better watch what I eat more. <laughs> yeah, I'm serious. It's like, oh my goodness, if I'm here, I have to be doing the best of my ability to accomplish what God wants. So it's like, <sighs> I got to control what I eat more because I'm not eating for me. I'm eating so I can do the work of the kingdom. This is a whole nother way of looking at life for me. But let's look at what happens in Genesis 12, 1 and 3. It says, the Lord said to Abram, get you out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to land I'm going to show you, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, and I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That is a mistranslation that Danny and I are going to be correcting in the Torah portion because in English, we have the word curse twice. Okay, I will curse him that curses you. Well, but they're different Hebrew words. Here's what it really says. It says, it says, I will bless them that bless you. And I will curse, like you think of a curse, those who esteem you lightly. Whoever despises you, whoever esteems you lightly, they're going to be greatly cursed. Wow. So they don't have to curse Israel like Balaam tried to do. If they just esteem Israel lightly, try to get rid of them as a nation, uh, that, that is heavy. Now, I have on this chart here, if you remember, we have the story of Haran dying. And so Abram takes Sarah and Lot and Terah, his father. They all move up to Haran, which is kind of like in Syria, Lebanon area. And then Nahor marries Milcah, one of the daughters And they stay over in that area. And it was when it's not, the command wasn't told Abram when he was over here. He is up here. And he says, I want you to leave this area and come down to the promised land. And here we see the Tower of Babel. And everyone is talking about Tower of Babel here. Yay, let's make a sign. We're all here. But what does the Lord Uh, have Abraham do. Abraham goes, no, I'm going to build up the name of Hashem. I'm going to build up my brother's name. And that is amazing. Now, also, when God tells him to go to this place and get out of your own nation, he said, go to yourself. In other words, we have the phrase, to your own self be true, right? We have to, you know, don't give fake news to you. All right, be true. Well, sometimes there's small talk. How I many you know a lot of people are just involved in small talk? How's the weather? You know, how's the kids? Whatever. But if you want to have a deep conversation, a real personal conversation, you have to get away from the crowd. You have to go out in the wilderness. Okay? If we want to have time to really talk to someone, you have to get away from the noise pollution. If you want to see the heavens, you've got to get away from the light pollution okay and location how many of you know location 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 it can make a big difference uh, the whole atmosphere well god knew abram could not experience spirituality in haran like he could in israel when you get to israel heaven's a local number let they say okay and so this is why i like so many people to come with me to israel and literally experience the field as a matter of fact, and we're leaving in a few weeks, if all still goes well, um, we're going to go to where the tabernacle literally was for almost 400 years in Shiloh, or Shiloh as it's really pronounced. You'll be standing right where the Holy of Holies was for 400 years. You can see physically, you can feel the presence of God in that place. 
And so in Genesis 12, verse 4 and 5, Abraham went as the Lord had spoken. Lot goes with them. And Abraham was how old? Okay, he's 75 years old when he left Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, that had died, all their substance that they have gained, and the persons they have obtained. What does that mean, the persons that they have obtained? That's not slaves, although they worked, they had a job, but that's like the souls he won to Hashem. All of those people who are now believing in the God of Abraham are coming with him. And they go towards the land of Canaan, and they came into the land of Canaan. And in case you didn't know, the very day he entered was Passover. It was on Passover, and I can prove that to you scripturally. But let's go on. Over 2,000 years ago, the Jewish sages had said, that there are three things that they need to go over with their disciples, all right? The first one, he said, was be deliberate in judgment and study the scriptures seriously and diligently, okay? If you're going to have a disciples, you've got to be deliberate in your judgment. You've got to be deliberate in your studying of the scriptures seriously and diligently. Well, Listen to what the New Testament says in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you can see, the, back then, that's what they taught. But secondly, they said this. Raise up many disciples. Why? So the teachings wouldn't be lost. This is why the Jews were the first one to start a great school, a high school. A college. They, they've been trying to educate their kids for thousands of years. Well, look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that you have heard of me among many witnesses commit you to faithful men who will, shall be able to teach others also. All right? Everybody wants kids, grandkids. Well, guess what? That's what I want in the spirit. That's what I want. This is why we want to become more of a teaching. I mean, we are not a milk and cookie, newly saved congregation. You know, we're more like a Bible college because we need people that are going to teach others to teach others to teach others. And I want to be a spiritual great, 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 great grandpa. And then the third thing they say is to make a fence for the Torah. What they mean by that is to protect the commandments by teaching the disciples to avoid behaviors that will lead to sinning. Well, let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from all appearance of evil. So all of these things are basically written in the New Testament. Then we come to Hebrews 11, verse 8 and 9, and it says, by faith, Abraham obeyed. So obedience is an aspect of faith. But don't just think law, think faith. Faith produces obedience. In other words, he left the country and he went to the place God was saying. And look at this. He, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive for an inheritance, he went out not knowing where in the world he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. It's interesting. It says intense. Intense means portable. Intense means temporary. And here he's living in tents his whole life, and he doesn't see the inheritance. Isaac doesn't see the inheritance. Jacob doesn't see the inheritance. And then look at this, Hebrews 11, 7. 18 and 18. By faith, Abraham, when he was what? Tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. 
Okay, now, I want you to grasp what this is really saying. God promised Abraham that his seed would come through Isaac. So when God told Abraham to offer up Isaac, he's saying, God, then you're either a liar or you're going to raise Isaac from the dead. And this is why in Hebrews it goes on to say, because his faith was that he would rise him from the, raise him from the dead. That's why he was willing to do it, because he believed that what God said. Now, Sarah didn't feel the same way. <laughs> she got kind of mad at Abraham. We'll look at that later. Okay. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing in Hebrew, here is the word for test. Okay. Well, guess what? Within the word for test is the word for miracle. And so God is testing Abram, and Abram is looking for a miracle. And when we get tested, like in the Our Father, it's not tempted because it says God tempts no man. But he tests everyone. And it's like if you build a chair, you ought to test it to make sure it's going to work. You sit in it. Or have your neighbor sit in it. <laughs> but uh, either way, we need to see testing when God does test us. He's going to provide a miracle for us to help us pass the test. That's fascinating when we look at that. Now, look at John 8, 39 and 40. Here, the Pharisees say to Yeshua, our father is Abraham. And Yeshua said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what? The works of Abraham. In other words, you would do what Abraham is doing. All right. Well, so the church says we're not supposed to do works. Well, wait a minute. We're supposed to do works. We're supposed to be doing the works of Abraham, which is doing acts of faith, obeying God. And then he says, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. And Abraham didn't do this. Now, here's what's important I want you to catch. God, Yeshua said, that if you were Abraham's children, you would do what? The works of Abraham. Abraham, his kids are going to do the works of Abraham. But look at Matthew 5, 14 and 16 and tell me what the difference is. He says, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can't be hid. Neither do men light a candle or put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it gives light to everyone in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see what? Your good works of Abraham and do what? Glorify your father in heaven. Well, look what it says in chapter 722. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works. And I will tell them, I never knew you depart from me. You that work iniquity. What is the difference? What do you see is the difference between those two statements? Anybody? Come on, come on. The difference is those that are doing wonderful works that are trying to glorify themselves. He's going to say, I don't know you. Those of you that do the wonderful works of Abraham are doing it to glorify Hashem. It goes right back to the Tower of Babel. They want to build a name for themselves. Abraham wants to build a name. Uh, there's also another verse in the scripture that says, seek uh, another man's wealth. Not seek your own wealth. Seek another man's wealth. This is one thing that I learned early on when I was about 19 years old in the business world. One of the things that helped me always be in management my whole life of different things was because I always tried to make my boss look good. It wasn't about making me look good. It was about making him look good. Because you know why? Every time he gets promoted, guess who he brings with him? And so the whole thing we have to realize, what I said from the very beginning, when we get up in the morning, it's not about you. It's about glorifying him. And if you're building his kingdom, he's going to give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. If you're only trying to build your kingdom, he has too many of those. He doesn't need those. Is this making sense? 
That's why the works that we do, it can't be to glorify ourselves. That's going to be the difference between those who are accepted from their wonderful works and those who aren't accepted. It looks like they're just name dropping. Okay, yeah, I prophesied in your name, and oh, I did this in your name. But they're using God as a tool to manipulate, to build their own kingdom. So then we see in Genesis 12, 6, and 7, Abram passes through the land to the place of Shechem. Now, Christians say Shechem, which is fine. That's English, so to speak. But the word is Shechem. Unto the plain of Moreh, which also in Hebrew means teacher. Okay? And the Canaanite was there, and the Lord appears to Abram, and he said, to your seed will I give this land. And so that is where Abram built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. Now, this is also fascinating for in the future, when we get to the book of Exodus, we see he built an altar to who? Okay, and what is the Lord's name? The yud heh vav -Heh. But when he appears to Moses in Exodus, he says, Abraham never knew me as the yud heh vav -Heh. Well, no, wait a minute. He said he only knew me as Elohim. He never knew me as yud heh vav -Heh. What's the answer to that? Well, with the, I mean, here, it, literally, it says the yud heh vav -Heh appeared to him. Elohim means God is the king, the judge, the one who uh, promises. But the yud heh vav -Heh is a part of God that is merciful, and you receive the promise. So Abraham knew he was yud heh vav -Heh, but he never experienced him as the yud heh vav -Heh, just like my dad can be a tax accountant. But if he never does my tax account, my taxes, I don't know him at a, as a, I know he's a tax accountant, but I never experienced him as a tax accountant. So Abram knew he was the yud heh vav -Hey, but he never got to experience him as the yud heh vav -Hey. You following? Okay. So here I have, the place he appeared was a place called Elon Moray. Now here is Israel, and here is uh, the altar of Mount Ebal, okay, Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Remember the two mountains? And in the middle is, it says Nobulus, but that is Shechem. Okay, so these are two hills, and you have Elon, uh, or you have Mount Ebal to the north, and you have the Har Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing over here. Here's where Jacob's well was. But in the middle, this is Shechem. Now look over there. That is Elon Moray. So this is where Abram built the altar. And many, uh, like a thousand years before it happens, he sees where Israel is going to come and do the blessings and the cursing. He sees that area. Okay, now let's go on for just a minute here. And how old is Abram when God does the promise? 75 years old. Let me see. And I wanted you to see this. There is Mount Moray in the red, around the red circle. Do you see that? Okay. I want to show you this. Way up here is Dan, which is right on the Lebanon-Syrian border. Does everybody see that? One of the things is uh, we can't go this December because of the war, but I've been here several times, and we'll try to go there next October. Do you remember, and I think I have it here. Let me, yeah, let's, uh, let's go back to our notes for a minute. Okay, in Genesis 12, 10 through 12, it talked about how there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was sore in the land. Now, how would you like to be Abram? God says, I'm going to give you this land. And there's a famine. <laughs> uh, can I go where there's food? You know. But he doesn't ask God what he should do. He just goes on his own down to Egypt looking for food. And it came to pass when he was come near to enter Egypt, he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold, now I know that you are gorgeous. And it'll come to pass when the Egyptians are going to see you, they're going to say, this is his wife, and they're going to kill me, but they'll keep you alive. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with this picture? 
Abram has all the faith in the world, okay, that this, the promises of God are going to come true, but now he thinks God's going to kill him. And Isaac isn't even born yet. How can he give birth to Isaac if he's not even been born yet? Now, how old is Abraham? How old is this raving beauty Sarah? 65. She's 10 years younger. Okay. Now, in Genesis 13, 18, we find he's left Egypt. He's come back with all kinds of cattle and silver and gold, which is like what happened to Moses when they left Egypt with all kinds of things. And they say what happens to the fathers is what's going to happen to the kids. Okay. <clears throat> and so now, in Genesis 13, 18, Abram moves his tent, and he came and lived by the oaks of Mamre, which are in what city? Hebron. And he builds an altar there to the Lord. Now watch chapter 14, 11 through 13. What happened, Lot gets captured. It says they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their food went their way, and they took Lot. Abram's brother's son who lived in Sodom and his goods and departed. One who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now, again, it says he lived by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, who was the brother of Eshcol, the brother of Aner, and these were allies of Abram. So you have to understand the Amorites controlled Hebron. The, everyone catch that. You have to catch that. The Amorites control Hebron. They're allies of Abram. And so Mamre is a person's name. Mamre is the name of an Amorite. And the oaks were called by him. He's building a name for himself, the oaks of Mamre. So the Amorites are the one in charge of Hebron. Now, in Genesis 14, 14 through 7, when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants that were born in his own house. Okay, his servants aren't slaves. These are servants that are they're born in his own house. 318, and they pursue them all the way to where? Remember I showed you where Dan was? He's down here in Hebron, which is down way down here. And he pursues them all the way up to Dan. Well, one of the coolest things, and a lot of people don't know it's there, and they miss it when they go to tell Dan. Remember, in Dan is where they also served, uh, make golden calves and wanted everyone when they split Israel into two, Judah and Ephraim. And uh, one of the Israeli leaders decide that they're going to do sacrifices in Bethel and Dan to keep the people from going to Jerusalem. Well, we go and we see that very spot where that happened. But if they go 100 yards and never, no one knows, this is the original gate of Dan. It's an adobe brick that Abraham went through. These are the actual stones Abraham walked on when he went through to cap get Lot back. You're going to see it. You're going to see it. And uh, it's, you, you can't really tell it. But a lot of people say the archway of doors was invented in Rome. No, 2,000 years earlier, they had a dome door. They were building adobe gates with the curved top. But anyway, this is one of my favorite places to go to think. We're talking Genesis now. We're not talking 2,000-year-old Roman Empire. We're talking 4,000-year-old Genesis. And we're right there. Okay, now... We're looking at Genesis. Well, let me, I'm not sure I'm going to go to this this week. So I'm, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to go to this a little bit later. Do you remember that Abram, Sarah dies. And Abram, she dies in Hebron. Abraham goes to bury her. But what is the name of the people group that is controlling Hebron now? It's the Hittites. 
In other words, at, in Genesis, at the first part, we see it was the Amorites. But when he goes to bury Sarah, the Hittites conquered the Amorites. And so what happens, they get the land for free, and they're charging an exorbitant price to Abram for the land. He's getting ripped off completely. But we'll look at that down the road. Now, here we see, in, uh, it goes on and he says, he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night smote them, pursued them to Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So see, they're going all the way up into Syria. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also when the people and now the king of Sodom goes out to meet him after his return. Remember, this is the people of Sodom that got taken. Here comes the king of Sodom. And it says in Genesis 14, 18. Now, what does Melchizedek mean? King of righteousness. That is a title. That's not his name. And he brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. There was always, in one sense, a priesthood. Adam was to be a priest. And it kind of went down through the ages until it gets to Shem. And now this, this is the priesthood if that when Jacob and Esau was fighting over the birthright, the birthright is where the priesthood goes to. And Esau already had kids. So you would think he would want it to pass it on to his generations, but no, he didn't want it. He despised it. And Isaac, who had no kids, knew how important it was and knew it would go through his descendants, even though we weren't even married yet. And so at a young age, he was fighting for that birthright because that's who the priesthood is going through. And so what do we find? He was the king of Salem. Where is Salem? Jeru Salem. And here's the, it says in Psalm 76 too, in Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place is in Zion or Zion. Now, do you guys remember why or how David came up with the name Jerusalem? If you remember, the city was called Jebus. It was called Salem, and then when people conquered, the first thing you do is change the name, and so it says when David was conquering it, it was called Jebus. Okay, so now David conquers it, and he wants to name it. Do you know what, how he decided what to name it? Anybody know? <clears throat> Here is the answer. If, do you remember when they called God Jehovah Jireh? Or year right, right? So he goes, oh, my goodness, should I call it Salem in honor of Melchizedek? Or Yaira, you know, where it says he is my provider, Abraham, you know, called him Jehovah Yaira. So he says, do I honor Melchizedek or Abram? He goes, I know. All Name it both, Yireh Salem, and that's where you get Jerusalem. There's no J's in Hebrew, Yireh Salem, provider of peace. And that's the one town that hasn't experienced peace in several thousand years. But I wanted you to know <clears throat> he's honoring Shem, which is why he wanted to call it Salem. He's honoring Abraham, which is why he wanted to call it Yireh, and he just put it together. Okay, <clears throat> now... Genesis 14, 21, the king of Sodom says to Satan, just give me the persons and you can have all the property. The Hebrew word there really implies souls. See, the king of Sodom, think of Satan. You can have the merchandise. I want the souls. And, or the prisoners. Well, in Genesis 14, 23, Abraham says, look, I'm not going to take a thread, even do a shoelace. I will not take anything that is yours, lest you end up saying that you're the one who made me rich. All I want is what these young soldiers have eaten, the portion of the men which went with me, and here's the three Amorites, let them have 
whatever they want, okay? He didn't want to, he wanted to do everything for God, and everyone knows God's the one who blessed him. So now we come to Genesis 15, 4 through 8. <clears throat> the word of the Lord comes to him, and he said, this man will not be your heir, but he will come out of your own body will be your heir. And so the Lord brought him outside, and he said, look at the sky. Count the stars. Remember all the stars I showed you a few weeks ago? <laughs> and he said, count them. And he said to Abraham, so shall your seed be. He believed in the Yude Baba, hey, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of what? Urkaz Deem. He was in the fiery furnace. That's, remember, I told you a couple of weeks ago, he was put into the fiery furnace and he survived it. And then Haran was put in the fiery furnace and he didn't survive it. Here is proof that he was also in the fiery furnace. Okay, <clears throat> but now look at this. Abram says, well, how will I know that I will inherit it? So it's like, what? Abraham has the faith to believe God for the children, but whether he'll get the land, he's not sure. Isn't that interesting? Even believers can have doubts. Here, Abraham has the biggest doubt in the world. He says, look, I can believe you as I count the stars and it's accounted as righteousness, my faith to believe in kids, but whether I get this land or not, nah, I don't know God. So just know that even Abraham had doubts. Okay. He wants reassurances from God. He wants a miracle or something to happen. And so what happens in Genesis 15, 17, and 18, it came to pass when the sun went down, it was dark, a smoking furnace, and there was a burning lamp that passes between the pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham saying, to your seed, I've given this land from the Nile to the Euphrates. So his land is a whole lot bigger than what Israel is now. But I think it's interesting if God breaks a covenant, I mean, cuts a covenant, he is going to keep his end of the bargain, which means if Abraham's going to see it, he's going to see it in his resurrected body. And it's going to happen right here on a planet near you. Now, looky here. Sarah, in Genesis 16, 1, Sarah, Abram's wife, was barren. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was what? What does Hagar mean? The stranger. Ha is the, Ger is stranger. So her name is the stranger. Now look at this. How old was Abraham when God gave him the promise of kids? 75. Well, now he is a six. <laughs> In Genesis 16, 16, Abram was 86 years old, and Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. So God had made this promise, and 11 years have gone by, and Sarah doesn't get pregnant. Well, guess what? 13 more years go by, and she's still not pregnant. In Genesis 17, 1 through 4, Abram is now 99 years old, and the Lord appears to him again. And he says, I am El Shaddai. God Almighty, walk before me, be blameless. I will make my covenant between me and you, multiply you exceedingly. And what happens? Abraham breaks his nose. He falls on his face. God talked with him, saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. He's like 100 years old, hasn't had any kids yet. And, and it's like, okay. And so let's look what happens in 5 through 8. God goes on and he says, Neither shall your name anymore be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I created you into. And I will 
make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations out of you. Kings are going to come out of you. I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you in their generations for how long? Everlasting covenant to be a God to you and to your seed after you. Notice how many times it says your seed after you. I will give to you and to your seed after you the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Wow. The United Nations wants to play God and determine the boundaries of nations. God set the boundaries at the very beginning according to the number of the children of Israel. And so we have to realize who's in charge. Who is in charge? Chart. A lot of people like to take authority and they want to be in charge, but it's like, sorry, you're not in charge. And so what do we find in Genesis 17, 9 through 14? God tells, oh, remember, he changes Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, right? What does he do? What happens when he changes their name? What letter is added to their names? The letter Hey. He gives a hey to Abram. He gives a hey to Sarah. We have the yud, hey, vav, hey. The two hey's from God's name, he gives to each of them and they produce life. He transforms them. But wait, there's more. It says here, in uh, Genesis 17, 19, 19, 14, God said to Abraham, as for you, you will keep my covenant, you and your seed, after you throughout their generations, and this is my covenant, which you're going to keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every male will be circumcised. He'll be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. It'll be a token of the covenant between me and you. Whoever is eight days old will be circumcised. Every male throughout their generations, he who was born in the house, brought with money from any foreigner who's not of your seed, he who was uh, born in your house, he who was bought with your money, must be circumcised. Must uh, My covenant will be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. The uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in flesh, that's who will be cut off from his people because he's broken my covenant. Oh, man, I mean, look at all those stars. How would you like to count all those stars? Okay, here we go. Genesis 17, 15 through 17. God says to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, don't call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. I will bless her and give you a son also of her. I will bless her. She will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And at this, not only does Abraham break his nose, he's cracking up laughing. Abraham falls on his face. And what is he doing? Laughing. Now, here's the word for laughter. It's a cock. Now, watch this. And he said in his heart, shall a child be born, born to him that is how old? A hundred years old, and shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear? And so what do we find in Genesis 18 too? What does Sarah do? She also laughed within herself, saying, after I am waxed old, will I have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? So, oh my goodness, they are both laughing. And then it says, Abraham called the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, it's cock. It means laughter. Now, you know what is really funny about this? How old was Abraham? And how old was Sarah? The kuf is 100. The tzade is 90. That's why they were laughing, because the hat is life, and they produce life. <laughs> Only God can take a 100-year-old, a 90-year-old, put it together, produce the chet, which is life, Am Yisrael Chai, the chet, live. And that's why they called him laughter, because that's a 100-year-old and 90-year-old having kids. It's hilarious. But many people don't realize it's all there in the Hebrew. With that said, let's stand. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing in our life and how you're increasing our trust in you, our faith in you. 
may it never end. And may over these next several years, all of us only increase in faith, increase in trust, increase in love for you, do a mighty work in all of our lives. And Father, I just thank you so much right now for all of those who support your ministry in magnifying the Torah, making it honorable uh, by their donations or tithes. Father, we just uh, encourage you to encourage them that they might also live and live abundantly and not live unto themselves but they're living to build your kingdom. There's so little time left till it comes. And all of us, we want to put and invest into your kingdom because that's the only one that is eternal. Everything here is going to burn. So, Father, we just thank you so much for all those who give. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break.